Brittle Bone Disorders Consortium is one of 21 consortia in the NIH-funded uh, Rare Disease Clinical Research Network. This is a program that uh, started over 12 years ago uh, and really was driven by the National Institutes of Health to really catalyze um, clinical research in um, rare diseases. And uh, two years ago, as uh, the community knows, we were lucky enough to be the first rare disease consortium funded focused on bone and specifically you know, osteogenesis and perfecter. Um, and so now we've been active for two years with investigators from all over the country and outside of the country um, putting that uh, reality, that dream to reality. We learned a lot even at the beginning of the BBDC because um, one of the major reasons we were competitive to for getting this uh, grant uh, from the NIH was because of the investment of the OI community and the families in the OIF and the Children's Middle Bone Foundation and many other organizations that contributed to the original support of the Link Clinical Research Centers. The LCRC uh, was really, think of it as the preamble of the BBDC. And that investment allowed us to first learn some important facts about what are the key important questions that we need to put forth in the BBDC. So for example, um, we just published the BBDC investigators an analysis of the data that came from the LCRC um, on pregnancy and showing in the largest study ever that um, C-sections, cesarean sections, did not really uh, decrease the rate of fractures in women who had uh, osteogenesis and perfecta. And so that, of course, has driven um, uh, a whole host of other studies, including pregnancy in the BBDC. So the BBDC is, is designed um, as two major projects, a series of pilot studies to stimulate research for the future, a very important training and advocacy component to really spread the information and to inform health professionals and families broadly, uh, and a very important contact registry to extend the reach really worldwide. Um, the first project is the core of the program, which we've now implemented and are in the midst of recruiting actively for. This is the uh, natural history study. It's designed to answer some very important questions. We now know there are many, many genes, over 14 genes that can cause OI and brittle bones. Well, what's the natural course related to if you have a mutation in type 1 collagen versus CRTAP versus uh, PEDF, all these different genes? And so that's what we call a genotype-phenotype study. And you know, it's designed where patients once a year come in as part of their routine visits. And we collect in an organized fashion information that we can then analyze, hopefully over a period of five to 10 years to really understand natural history. Another important part of the natural history study uh, is the um, uh, f focus on the skeleton, specifically scoliosis, which is a major problem in severe OI, irrespective of the gene that causes it. And um, it's a problem because the current medications that we use to treat OI, bisphosphonates, doesn't really affect necessarily the nature of scoliosis. So we need to understand the progression, the current interventions, are they effective, and then potentially in the future, are there now treatments that could actually affect that? A flip side of that is in milder OI, OI type 1, patients can have compression fractures. And another part of the lo not longitudinal study or the natural history study focuses on what's the natural course of this. We still don't know. Well, should we see these compression fractures? Should we treat more aggressively? Should we not? And so understanding the natural course from childhood to adulthood is very important. And then finally, as part of the uh, natural history study, uh, we have the dental component, which is really to understand um, oral health in uh, OI. And that involves, again, regular dental evaluation, intraoral photographs to document dentition and the status of health of teeth. And, uh, and then that is another important component. So that's the core. So the contact registry is really a very important part of the RDCRN in general. So beyond just the BBDC, it is a um, uh, mechanism and registry, which is basically a a way of patients contacting investigators based in the DMCC, which is the Data Management Coordination Center. 
Um, this is led by Dr. Jeff Krischer at the University of South Florida, and he does this for all of the consortia, all 21. Now, in addition, he's actually an investigator of our consortium. And um, he, as part of this contact registry, patients from all over the world um, can establish a record that's completely confidential and covered by all the HIPAA protections and so forth, and allow us as a, investigators in the consortium to reach out to them and tell them about news, about protocols, um, but more importantly, directly engage them in research. So f as I said, in the pregnancy ancillary study, which is part of the natural history study, the core of that is actually just a survey tool. And so that will be sent out via this um, registry. We have over a thousand individuals already um, registered, which is wonderful. It's a way for patients who perhaps can't get to a site um, in, other part, in some parts of our country where there isn't a site close by can participate all nonetheless uh, through the registry. Um, it's a way for patients from outside of the U.S. to participate. And so uh, it's a really important tool for all families to get involved in. There are two new ancillary studies to the longitudinal study. These are natural history studies, but they're ancillary, meaning that they are not in the core protocol, and not everyone might participate. So you can think of them as sub-studies. The first is actually a deeper look at uh, oral, oral and craniofacial development in individuals with OI, uh, and using uh, much more sophisticated imaging techniques, uh, something called comb beam CT scanning, um, also oral scans, to really integrate dental status with craniofacial status. And so that's a one that's about to be launched. It hasn't been fully yet. We're going through the IRB process. And then the second one, which again will be launched soon, is the pregnancy. So again, the LCRC analysis really pointed to other questions we needed to focus on with regards to um, um, a more in-depth look. And so that will be a freestanding pregnancy study, uh, which will be implemented through the contact registry. The pilot projects include uh, two pilot projects. Um, the first is actually a urinary biomarker pilot project. And the idea there is, um, could we get some initial information to ask whether this is something we should pursue? That's the definition of a pilot project. And in the biomarker project, led by Dr. David Ayer at the University of Washington, the clinical sites are collecting urine from individuals with all types of OI. We want to target about um, 25 to 30 individuals. Um, and then test whether a very highly specialized and sensitive um, measurement of cross-links of collagen, so this is a very special modification of collagen, can actually predict the type of OI, predict the severity, and response to treatment. So that's something that's going on, and um, I think we have seven uh, individuals rec recruited by sites, and we want to continue to do that. There should be enormous enthusiasm and expectation for making advances. I mean, at the end of the day, the purpose of the consortium is to help patients' lives. So I think that's absolutely appropriate to, to expect there to be benefits coming down the pipeline. I think the question of a cure is much more difficult. I think that, you know, a cure is a, a very high bar, and we're all moving towards it. But to put it in perspective, you know, the first 30 years, I would say even 40 years of OI research uh, has been focused on just understanding um, what causes OI. Right? For 30 years, we thought it was just type 1 collagen. And as you know, in just the past 10 years, it went from type 1 collagen to 14 other genes. So it was only in the past decade that the full spectrum of causality has been delineated. Okay, so that's great, but there is an enormous path to travel from understanding what causes a disease to how it causes a disease, i.e. mechanism. So there's still a ton of work that has to be done in terms of mechanism, and that's often done in the laboratory on patient cells, on animal models, and uh, there's a lot of that being supported in, in, by NIH. But it's only after you do that, then can you translate that to a treatment and then when you have many, many treatments, then maybe you get at, quote, a cure, 
which again is a relative definition. You know, a cure for one person may not be a cure for another person. I think a cure is when you can have a treatment manage or approach which may involve many things that brings your quality of life back to what you would normally have. And so um, I like that definition because it, it gets at the core of, of what we're going after. But there's still an enormous amount to be done. I think that this consortium is a catalyst, as I said, but um, we, we are still have a big mountain to climb in front of us. These consortia, <clears throat> and specifically our consortium, really can achieve several things. I mean, there, there are direct medical impact issues which we can talk about. But at the very core, one of the values, just broadly, irrespective of what disease it's studying, is it brings all the minds and the families together to work in unison in one direction. You know, when you're flow, all flowing one direction downstream, you get there really fast. And so that's been catalytic and, I think, potentially transformative. You know, I think it's not to say that, that people didn't work together in the past. I think the OI community has collaborated, worked very well together. Um, but there are just some things one group, two groups, three groups can't do because it's a rare disease. So it's really especially targeted at answering questions where the only way to answer that question is not working on a mouse in the laboratory or working on one or two or three or ten patients in this site, but you've got to bring the whole population together. So that's number one, right? By developing an infrastructure that brings investigators together to collaborate, you're integrating your efforts, you're putting your brain power together, you're up applying a much greater denominator in terms of patient participation. That's number one. I think number two is in fact the goals, the prime goal which every consortium has, and that is the natural history study. That's very powerful because the only way to determine whether you're doing a benefit when you're treating a disease in whatever way, whether it's cell therapy, gene therapy, medical therapy, surgical therapy, you've got to understand what the course of that disease is. Because it may be that it's the course of the disease that fractures are decreasing as you get older anyway. And so now you treat the patient and you say, oh, the fractures are decreasing. Well, you just, you know, maybe fooled ourselves to think that the treatment works. So it's very important to define in a quantitative fashion the natural course of the disease. So I think that foundation can stimulate downstream clinical trials, and it has, because one of the other goals is to get industry involved, industry wanting to develop treatments. You know, one of the great barriers for industry is that they've got to prove whether a drug works or not to the FDA. And um, to do that, you need con the kind of things that we've been talking about. So the experience of the RDCRN broadly has been when consortia have been successful, it has stimulated industry involvement. And I think we're already beginning to see that. Um, you know, with the support of industry, of, you know, the OIF, with their interest in actually labeling drugs, meaning going to the FDA to get approval with, uh, in OI, which is very important because only for approved drugs can you often get payers, insurance companies, uh, to pay and cover that treatment. So I think that's, you know, outside of the basic science questions and, and that we've been talking about, that's the real also important deliverable long term for these consortia. So I think that with regards to project one, I would like to have, you know, a thousand individuals which we follow for five or so years and for that data to now be readily accessible, not just to us, but to it, all researchers interested in OI and, and companies in, interested to develop drugs to ask, you know, what should we be looking for if we're asking whether this treatment is working. I think that's one. I think with regards to the second project, the second project, which is a phase one trial on this new drug that we're testing against TGF-beta, I think if we show that that drug is safe and has positive effects, it doesn't prove that it works because the, the phase one trial on fresalumumab, you know, in this, in this approach to block TGF-beta, is not an efficacy trial, the phase one trial, but if it leads to phase two and three trials focused on efficacy by, you know, company partners, that would be spectacular because then, it, again, the consortium has achieved its goal of catalyzing investment by industry partners to move things to, to FDA label status. I think that if we see the approval uh, and or continued development of new therapies by 
partners in industry who may not be doing actual studies in the BBDC, but who've again leveraged our expertise, that would be wonderful. I think that if the OI community as a whole um, increase in size, awareness, and, and, and OI therapy, even what we do now gets brought into um, many, many other healthcare providers throughout the world, certainly in the US, so that every city there's uh, someone that has heard about the OIF and heard about OI, that would be enormously successful. I mean, um, you know, how many times do we hear a patient, they get diagnosed with OI and the first thing they say is they've never heard about it and none of their doctors have heard about it. We don't expect every doctor to be an expert in treating OI, but if the consortium and the OIF together as, long, as well as the other partners can increase awareness so that the resources are clearly easily available, that will be important. Um, I think those would be amazing achievements at the end of, you know, five years. I'm not, um, you know, being a uh, geneticist, a pediatric geneticist, a practicing physician in this area and in rare diseases. Um, I think that that's, that's always going to be the case, but what we want is, of course, to continue to decrease that number. And probably, whether they know the word OI or whether they um, know what tests to, to order is not necessarily all that important or the goal. I mean, it would be great if that's the case. But more importantly is to recognize that um, there's something that I need to do as a next step, refer this patient to somewhere because, you know, um, recognizing when certain features are just not, you know, associated with normal health. That would be good. You know, again, it's not necessary to be a topical expert, but to just have heard of brittle bones even, uh, and that that can be genetic. If, if every doctor in America knew that, we would have, you know, won two-thirds of the battle. A very important part of the BBDC is the fact that the OIF and all OI families in general are part, are partnership and actual investigators in, in the grant. Um, while we, as a network, have enormous support from the OIF, OIF actually gets support from the BBDC to achieve aims within the grant, and that is in the area of education, training, uh, and advocacy. Um, the training part is to train the next generation of rare disease researchers, and so the OIF has been amazingly effective in f finishing all parts of their aims even before we in the academic centers. Um, so, uh, you know, Tracy and with the support, Tracy Hart with the support of the board have really um, made great advances on this one. So, for example, they hosted the uh, clinical research workshop focused on rare bone disease at the 2015 American Society for Bone Mineral Research. This was a workshop focused on bringing um, both experienced, new, and young investigators to a pre-meeting at the annual ASBMR meeting, a meeting of over 3,000 people, uh, to learn about rare bone diseases and understand the tools that are used in studying rare bone diseases and, and clinical tools uh, included. So that was attended by several hundred individuals and that was wonderful and I think really helped to achieve a strategy for doing this. Another very important part is to really educate healthcare providers. And one of the major aims of the training component of the grant was to develop an electronic um, web-based toolkit for doctors who now have OI patients, but they're not necessarily experts, and you know the patients can't always be referred every month to an OI center, and they can use the toolkit to help guide management and, and, uh, and, and treatment of patients. So that has already been achieved, and that's been wonderful. And of course, another component, which I think just got completed, was the focus on adult health in OI. And they, the OIF has also just rolled out their OI, adult OI health uh, toolkit. So um, I think that's been a, a amazingly effective and a big part of our, uh, our consortium.